But I, I do think that President Trump and his people, when they came in, they sensed that there were some problems in US foreign policy and they wanted to make corrections. Um, and I would say that to be fair, two broad things that Trump and his people did with respect to China policy were actually um, helpful in this. First, of course, uh, Trump and his people garnered a lot of attention to the way in which China was you know, flouting international rules and gaming the global trading and commerce system, uh, sort of undermining the competitiveness of the US and particularly other developed economies. Um, and this problem certainly cannot be laid all at China's feet. And if we do that, we may end up actually not making the changes that we need to make at home but certainly China's behavior needed to be addressed in a concerted way. Um, and President Trump got China's attention. Um, the second thing that I think was good about the Trump approach to China is that President Trump was focused like a laser on this trade issue. And he did not become distracted by other issues in the US-China relationship. Now, some would say this is bad because maybe China got a free pass on issues like human rights or other things. There are a lot of issues in the US-China relationship, of course. Um, but I think there are um, you know, certain upsides to prioritization and clear focus. Uh, because if you get into a lot of other issues, then things can just swirl around and the talks drag on and nothing gets done. Um, it's much easier for a counterpart in a negotiation to just prolong the discussion if you're not able to focus and bear down on the issues you're trying to prioritize. So I think that was another good thing about the Trump approach. Um, unfortunately though, the negatives in President Trump's approach far outweighed, in my view, and undercut the positives. Um, so problem number one was really kind of a lack of strategy. Um, the China policy was more like an attitude, a kind of art of the deal leverage building, if you will, to continually you know, think up measures to um, press against China in order to build up leverage for the negotiation on trade. Uh, it wasn't really a very coherent framework for dealing with a complex relationship like China. Um, second, you know, the unilateralism has been, I think, remarked upon widely as a big problem. Uh, you know, you need pressure from others that have the same kinds of concerns that you have so that you can build a united approach and a common uh, kind of pressure strategy to try to maximize your leverage and get what you want. Um, third, you know, there was a lot of ill discipline in messaging. And, you know, we have the famous Twitter account, which is part of the issue, but also just lots of stray voltage coming from all kinds of different people in the administration. Many Trump officials, um, we're making the Chinese leadership a target for regime change, which was undercutting the negotiations that they were trying to have on the trade deal and certainly undercutting the Chinese negotiators in that deal. Um, and of course, in the end, uh, President Trump saw the need to blame China for all of his problems during his reelection campaign and really ramped up this kind of transparently, I think, self-serving demonization campaign against China in order to sort of obscure other problems that were coming up in the context of the campaign. So this is really where things stand currently. I think it must be said that permanent damage has been done to the US-China relationship um, and we will have to uh, deal with that going forward. But I don't think it's possible now to put um, the genie back in the bottle, so to speak, on things like calling for regime change in China or calling for sort of the delegitimation of the, of the Chinese government, which in fact is the authority and power that we now have to deal with on problems where we need China's help. 
So those problems and the notion in China that the US now is really out to undercut and, and block China's development going forward, China's economic development, China's rise um, is, another, is another thing that now, I think it was always there a little bit maybe left unsaid, but now that it's been said, it's, it's much more indelible. Um, of course, I'm not implying that China is blameless in the deterioration of this relationship. Uh, China claims that the US is its most important overseas relationship, and yet it has made little effort in recent years to address any of the US concerns. In particular, in the last decade since the great financial crisis, I think China's concerning behavior has escalated in terms of you know, rollback of reform and economic opening, um, domestic repression and intolerance of criticism. Um, and I think China has been closing really to the outside world. Um, these factors, I think in tandem with a more aggressive and militaristic foreign policy have given rise to major concerns about China's uh, future trajectory in the world. How will it behave in the world as its power grows? So now we turn to the question of what uh, can the Biden administration do about all of this? Um, you know, I think, and I worked in the Obama administration, as Yahweh mentioned, I was a career uh, foreign service officer. So I served, uh, I think, nine different secretary of states of both parties. And I did uh, work in the Obama administration and have some familiarity with where Joe Biden or how he views China and how he views international relations in general. And I think he has a very realistic and balanced view personally of the China challenge. Um, you, I could see his influence in the Obama administration. Of course, Obama was not very experienced in foreign policy matters. Joe Biden as vice president had been the um, Senate Foreign Relations Committee chair uh, intermittently in the Senate while he was there. So had a lot of foreign policy experience and you could see his influence in, uh, for example, efforts to get China to do more in the way of providing public goods to the international system, things like peacekeeping, um, the Ebola response. Um, you saw, I think Biden's influence in the efforts to push back on trade problems in, in uh, addressing cyber uh, intrusions and challenges and in pushing back on China's island building in the South China Sea, et cetera. So Biden is a defender of the international system. He believes in democracy and openness, I think, and finds Beijing's system of governance and many of its practices um, objectionable for sure and frustrating. But he, he wants to change China's behavior, not block or contain China's growth and not to try to run China from Washington DC or overturn uh, the governing authority in China. He wants to avoid war. And um, I think, you know, these are all, this is a very sort of pragmatic picture. Um, I think Biden would like to be able to harness cooperation with China to help him on some major catastrophes that he's faced with, uh, including the pandemic, uh, climate change, um, and probably other transnational issues. And he realizes he needs to deal with the second largest economy in the world if we want to um, proceed with our economic recovery coming out of the pandemic. Um, and he understands the need to work with others to sort of maximize pressure and leverage on China in order to try to affect China's behavior and decision making in the way that we'd like to see. However, you know, cooperation with China is very difficult to sell now publicly in the United States. And it's also going to be pretty low down on the list of Joe Biden's priorities when he comes into office. Um, and he's listed those, you know, the, the getting out of this pandemic is job one, two and three. Um, having some kind of economic recovery, addressing U.S. healthcare systems, uh, addressing racial inequality and discrimination, and dealing with the uh, threat of climate change. And, and none of these are strictly foreign policy issues per se. Um, but I think 
the likelihood of divided government coming in the future. And you all in Georgia have something to say about that apparently. Um, but it's likely that we'll have divided government. Um, and that probably means that domestic priorities are gonna be difficult to prosecute. And that may mean that Biden will look to some early foreign policy wins to show you know, that he's moving his agenda forward. Um, I think he will try to leverage some COVID stimulus uh, for getting some of his domestic priorities moving, but, but I think that will be difficult. So he'll, he'll, he'll move out quickly to try to show US leadership in the international system. I think he'll rejoin multilateral institutions um, you know, starting with the WHO, probably prolong the arms agreement with the Russians, the New START Treaty that's about to uh, expire. He'll rejoin the Paris Accord, things that we've all heard about. Um, and I think, you know, much has been made of this effort also to try to get, you know, our allies on board for a united front against China, sort of hold a summit of democracies, if you will. And I think, you know, this is understandable. And we talked about the problems of Trump's unilateralism. So this could be useful if it injects some kind of uh, lift into the performance and competence demonstrated of, of democracies and the development of kind of a coherent assess assessment of how to uh, reform the international system. But I think if a big summit of like-minded countries, democracies focuses solely on China, it's not going to be successful and not going to achieve the goals it set out to achieve. Um, I don't know if the Biden administration is going to avoid the mistake of making the US-China relationship into an ideological contestation or not. I don't think that's what Biden wants to do, but he does need a story so that he can get resources for what he wants to do out of Congress for things like research and development money, uh, innovation, infrastructure building, et cetera. And so um, this is a, a narrative that's out there that everyone talks about how this is the bipartisan consensus, especially in Congress. So it, it may um, be deployed for that uh, purpose. Of course, China wants to stabilize the relationship with the US. Um, but this isn't the same as cooperating. And I think the drumbeat on China in the US will make it hard for Biden to concede much. Um, and that will make it also hard for the Chinese to concede too much. Um, I don't think China is gonna be backtracking on Hong Kong or Xinjiang in the face of outside pressure. I think that probably will just stiffen their resolve. So I anticipate that the US-China diplomatic relationship under a Biden administration will restart slowly. I think Biden will be under pressure to continue negative Trump measures against China, especially in, from Congress. And I think the absence of any real counter message from US business and um, allies and other elements of the U.S. public will make it difficult for him to really dramatically change course on this issue in the near term. Um, I hope that through some more positive and pragmatic public statements, the new administration can signal that the U.S. is returning to a path of diplomacy, that we're going to have a pragmatic attitude, that we're going to seek cooperation to overcome these challenges that face us like the pandemic and the economy and climate. And I think, um, you know, if we can do that, that will set us on a better path than the one we're on right now. But I think it's, you know, we're in a hole and it's gonna be a climb to get out of it. And we need to see effort, not just from the United States, but also from our Chinese counterparts to get things back on the right track. Um, and maybe just as I close out my co opening comments, just a quick uh, advertisement or recommendation for further reading. Um, I'm very proud of my Yale and Brookings Institution colleagues. We put out a long series of papers today with proposals on what uh, the Biden administration could do to uh, make improvements or for um, making progress in a number of the difficult areas in the US-China relationship from human rights to economic issues to the South China Sea, et cetera. So if you're interested, you can look for that on the Brookings website. And I'll 
close it out there and hope I've helped you enough to inspire some tough questions. Honey. Okay, coming. <laughs> there we go. All right. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, Susan, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very valuable, balanced overview. The issues are, are clearly challenging. <laughs> um, but let, let me start by asking you, the, um, you made the point that China's behavior internally and externally has tended to go um, you know, concerning behavior has increased at least since the financial crisis and more and more recently even um, with internal and that Biden would like to change that behavior. Of course, changing China is always a, a, a fraught activity. But I wanna ask you, why do you think these changes have happened within China? You know, what's, how can we understand from China's perspective what's happening and therefore maybe we would have a better way to respond? Well, I can try to answer that and get inside the heads of our counterparts in China, but I'd be curious to, to, as to your answer to this since you've also spent a lot of time with Chinese counterparts. Um, you know, I, I do think that the great financial crisis, as we cleverly renamed it to deflect the origin away from ourselves, um, did give Chinese leaders a lot of pause and sort of changed um, kind of the way they looked out at the world and thought about what they were doing as far as, um, you know, kind of following the US model and integrating themselves into the international system. I think they, they saw more dangers than they had realized um, maybe were out there. And of, of course, the Chinese system has always been good at seeing dangers. It's, it's, it's a kind of a fragile, brittle, let's face it, uh, governing system. I mean, Yahweh talked about what happened in 1976 and um, 1979, and, and it's been, it's been um, you know, kind of ups and downs. And so I think, uh, you know, the system is very good at seeing dangers and overcorrecting, overcompensating for perceived dangers. And I think we've seen that really since the great financial crisis probably. And not just the um, sort of rolling back of kind of the reform and opening agenda in the economy, but also, of course, the, you know, repression against internal um, dissent. Uh, of course, the um, sort of a lot of this is being done under the cloak of kind of systematization and uh, regularization. So, for example, you had the foreign NGO law that was passed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a long time in coming. They kept telling everyone it was coming, but nobody expected it to be as draconian and obviously aimed at making it very, very difficult for civil society organizations to operate in China as it was. Now, maybe we should have expected that, but I think that is, um, you know, a reflection of many, many things that have happened, you know, crackdowns on sort of uh, rights lawyers in China and all kinds of other areas um, internally, uh, not to mention more recent developments such as things happening in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. So, you know, if you look across the board, it really looks like there is um, a, a lot of worry. And of course, Xi Jinping constantly talks about how we're faced with the period of greatest change not seen in a hundred years. And that's not a good thing, I don't think, from where they sit. I mean, they are busy kind of building up defenses, um, seeing threats and trying to prevent them from coming to the, any closer to the doorstep, that kind of thing. And this, I think, explains a lot about how the U.S.-China relationship has developed in the last 10 years, actually. Well, when we look at it from uh, you know, an economic development point of view, and go back to Hu Jintao and the beginning of ind indigenous innovation and the reforms or you know, investments that were being done starting then and going forward. 
um, a lot of it makes sense in terms of building capabilities, right? In terms of, you know, you move up the value chain. Of course, you, you want to be able to produce things that have higher value and let the others go to Bangladesh. That's fine. Um, and train the, train the, the workers, have higher education, and eventually become innovative, right? Which is kind of where they're at with the 14th um, five-year plan is now we're at the, the frontiers and we want to be able to have our own innovation. And all of that is what we would recommend countries to do. But at the same time, it seems that on the political side or the social side, there's a, like Susan Shirk said, this fragile superpower, that there's something very worrisome from the leadership's point of view that you know, the economy has moved more towards market in, me in many sectors and in many ways, and they've moved up the value chain. They've been very successful. And at the same time, then the leaders seem scared of all these things that you just mentioned. And yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of discussion right now, of course, of this dual circulation theory, which, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's, there is, um, you know, there, it is worth considering, and there is discussion in the American academic community about, you know, how much of this is coming from uh, initiated by China, and how much of it is a reaction to things that others are doing. For example, the United States. So, when we see discussion of the dual circulation theory, a lot of people are looking very closely at this. They're trying to decode it, um, which is also always very difficult. But you know, the, the general consensus seems to be that this is a way of covering a move toward you know, um, self-reliance really. And um, you know, more, as you mentioned, indigenous innovation, but also relying on our own consumer market, not being dependent on the outside, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that in part because they've, you know, been threatened now by the United States in, in many of these areas through our uh, entity listings and export controls and threats to try to contain their economy, et cetera. And so they're doing what, you know, in, that, in the face of those kinds of threats, um, what might be seen as a pretty reasonable response of trying to diversify away, trying to build in resilience, et cetera. All the things that you know, most economies are now saying in the wake of the pandemic that they should be doing. So mm -hmm. um, you know, how much of this is, the other thing about dual circulation, I mean, we have been begging China to um, rely more, uh, move away from this export driven Right. Um, economy and more toward this consumption led model. And so now they're doing that, but now we're seeing all kinds of uh, shades of, you know, malintent behind it. And, you know, it's just, um, it's a very complicated picture. And I think we often um, are quick to assume some kind of malign or nefarious intent when if you look at the whole picture you would see actually that there are a lot of things that are just rational responses going on but it's very hard to separate this out and of course the you know kind of prevailing narrative that we have and the media environment doesn't really lend itself to this kind of nuanced analytical discussion right so um the the, the you know the sound bite or the or the first thing that pops up becomes sort of the dominant narrative and then it's very hard to turn. So I think, you know, China has brought some of this on itself. There's no question about that. And they've not been always very skillful at arguing their side or communicating or within their public diplomacy, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we could um, maybe say is that a lot of people you know, in the, it, while the U.S. was sort of preoccupied with this isolationist, unilateralist drive under President Trump, you know, people said, well, China's like moving into the space that is being left by the United States. But in fact, um, you know, China has, has not done as well as they might have done if they had been a little bit more skillful with their diplomacy in some of these areas. So um, I think we both have things to answer for. I I um, think the public narrative has really gone pretty far now, so it's going to be hard to just 
self-correct, it's going to take uh, uh, some effort and some time and some, um, you know, kind of pragmatic outreach on to try to get some points on the board on the on the sort of positive side of the ledger, if that's possible. Yeah, on the um, on the innovation side, um, you know, the 14th, the new 14th five year plan has many mentions of innovation, but it also has many mentions of security and national security, building national security um, and, and technology. And from our side with the export controls and now even this week, the Trump executive order for US investors not to invest in 31 companies um, and that list could, it could increase for, you know, easily. Um, my, my concern is that there, there are certainly areas where the U.S. should protect technology that's really important to our national defense and, um, and, and pay more attention to that than we have in the past. But the way that innovation works these days is that it's much, it's very cooperative and there's comparative advantage all over the world and expertise and they come together and they create new, new ideas and new technology and, and all of it because of the internet, the, the AI pieces might be considered national security. Right, the whole yeah. digital, anything that's digital is potentially used in the military. And so we really need to figure out a way to isolate what part of that innovation is really needs to be done close to our chest and the rest can be done openly. Otherwise, we're gonna lose our technological edge too. Yeah, so I can, I can completely. I completely agree. I mean, I think the connections between economics and technology and national security are being overdrawn. Um, certainly there are some technologies that are sensitive. That's always been the case. I mean, that's why right. we had this COCOM export control regime when the, in the time of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, but the problem now, as you mentioned, is that, you know, military and civilian are, are basically the same. I mean, we we, we have civ, civ mill fusion. This is something we always hold up as a bogeyman on the part of China. But I mean, this is the fact uh, uh, around the world that, that you know, dual use items are very prevalent now in the military. And clearly not all technologies are equally sensitive and we need narrow targeting um, of the most sensitive technologies. And we cannot, aspire to create this zero risk environment that we seem to be going for now. I mean, that is just too expensive. Um, so we need to maintain open access to technology platforms. And we, of all people in the world, we are the United States of America, we're for openness. We should avoid creating a world of separate technology zones. This will be incredibly debilitating. Um, we need to maintain access, open access to, to common platforms. Um, this is what we need for our sort of com commercial and economic future, our, our spiritual and cultural future. Um, all of our inherent advantages would, re would rely on that. Um, but right now, really no one seems willing to compromise. Um, we could end up in the worst of all worlds with a sort of a US based platform, a EU-based platform and a China-based platform. And I, I'm not sure that, that ours would be the largest, you know, have the largest area if, mm -hmm. if that was the case. So I really think um, the U.S. is farther behind in thinking about this in, in some ways than either the EU or China because we have left it in the hands of the private sector and not done much regulation um, and it seems to me that, you know, the, the train has already left the station in some ways in Europe and in China, and uh, we need to get in the game. <laughs> yeah, well, this definitely should be part of the Biden administration's story, as you say, that somehow 
pull together the benefits of this openness and cooperation with China is just one of the pieces, right? As you right. as you suggested with the allies, it's best to work with allies in a broad sense, not our allies against China, right? Because that's going to create lots of problems, obviously. And so if somehow the Biden administration could create the, the, the story where we are, America's open to, to work with the world again, and then put a technology spin on that, put a political spin on that, put a climate change spin on that, then maybe that would work. Right. I mean, I do think that, and this gets to a much bigger theme than US China, but I do think that you know, we, we never really had a conversation in, the, in this country about, you know, what we were doing in the world when the Soviet Union collapsed. We just kind of went mm -hmm. into this democracy promotion and interventionist and unipolar superpower mode. Um, and I do think that now the Biden administration has a chance to kind of have that conversation, but the problem is we're faced with so many domestic challenges and people mm -hmm. are so preoccupied with those that it's probably not going to happen. And, you know, until we really come up with what our vision is, I think it's very hard for us to get back into the, to the game of what we should be doing and, and all sort of pulling in the same direction. And there's certainly a lack of consensus in, in, in the country right now, obviously, about U.S. You know, purpose in the world and what we should be doing out there. Um, so I, I, you know, and, and the U.S.-China relationship is a, big, is a big part of that, but it's also going to be carried along by, you know, what happens in that space um, one way or the other. Yeah. Now, one of the, the tricky pieces, of course, from the U.S. point of view is human rights. And you've mentioned that uh, in a number of contexts, but that would also, the, the Biden administration has to navigate that issue. And, you know, how is it that an administration can show they care about human rights because they do, but also not say, well, unless, you know, things change in Xinjiang, we're not going to talk to you or something. You know, there has right. to be some way to cast that story. And, and it, in other parts of the world as well, it's not just, just in China, but it's how do you say, well, yes, that's important, but we set it aside for now, or Yeah, I really hope our, our, our diplomacy doesn't start to follow the way we're behaving now domestically, which is that if I don't like you, I don't talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> because that has been a creeping feature of our diplomacy, sort of holding conversation hostage uh, and thinking that somehow that's going to produce the result that you want. And it, I don't think it ever has. So I would definitely counsel staying away from drawing these red lines and getting in a huff and taking your toys and going and, and, and going home. Um, on human rights, I mean, the Biden administration is going to pay attention to this. It is a core part of our foreign policy and, is, and of who we are as a nation, obviously. Uh, we need to return to first principles and human rights and being a human rights defender is, is part of that for sure. Um, but I think, you know, Biden's been at this a long time. He's seen, you know, the mistakes that we've made as well as the, as the advances and victories we've been able to count. And I think he understands the need for pragmatic uh, patience on this. Um, you know, China is, you know, a major power in the world. It's a proud country with a long standing tradition and history and culture, uh, different system from ours. Um, and, you know, it's um, certainly not perfect, uh, but nobody is. Um, I think the thing to focus on is that China has signed up to certain international rules and standards, and those are certainly relevant, both for, for China's own reputation, but also for our expectations and treatment of China going forward. So 
we, we can raise human rights issues bilaterally and we do and we should. And I've always been a proponent of the human rights dialogue even though it infuriates the people that have to participate in it. And I have been one of those people on the other side of the table. Um, but I still think it's very important to listen to what um, the Chinese say they're doing and then to talk about what we perceive them doing. I mean, this is, if you're not, with two such different systems, if we're not doing that, then we're just getting nowhere. Um, and so, you know, as frustrating as it may be, we have to do that. Um, but also the multilateral arena is really key to human rights issues because, um, you know, it is a matter of China's governance, most of these issues. And if you, you don't want to make it one country's, you know, um, against, against another, you want to have it couch it in terms of international rules and standards and that China needs to live up to its commitments and try to press um, through the multilateral uh, venues. Um, but in the end, I mean, I think the thing we have to realize on the human rights account is that China is gonna need to make these changes itself. And, um, you know, sanctions and penalties can do two things. They can make us feel good because we did something and they can, um, you know, stop some actor from getting some piece of equipment or some uh, monetary transaction or something. But they're not very good at actually changing behavior um, mm -hmm. of a government. So as long as we're clear about what we think we're going to get from doing these penalties, and as long as they don't cost too much, I suppose you can do it. But there are costs to these things and it's not likely to have the desired effect. So I think, you know, I'm not uh, as enthusiastic about sanctions in response to everything as a lot of people are now currently in both the Congress, but also the students in my, in my classes at Yale. <laughs> um, because I, what I see is these measures just make other governments and not just the Chinese government, um, I worked with a lot of governments around the world. Um, and, you know, they tend to just dig in when you do things like this. So um, I would be a proponent of, of working more pragmatically and constructively on these issues with an eye toward it's going to take a while and they need to come to it on their own. Yeah. Well, one more topic before we open it up to the, to the audience. Um, there's a, a, a range of opinions, it seems, at the moment and analyses about how assertive or aggressive China really is in, in Asia in particular. Um, you know, is China expansionist or not? And it goes from no, it's not and hasn't been historically to yes, it's terribly aggressive and it's going to take over the world kind of analyses. Um, and you talked about, you know, China being, um, you know, not great behavior in certain aspects of the South China Sea with the islands, of course, and so uh, other kinds of, of actions uh, in in Asia in particular. What, but what is your take in terms of how how expansionist China is behaving now, and what you expect in the future? Yeah, this is the favorite, you know, Washington uh, um, sort of cocktail hour <laughs> conversation or academic roundtable conversation. Um, and, and frankly, you know, nobody really knows because China's power is growing and its interests as its power grows are going to expand. And, um, you know, that's in some respects natural and legitimate uh, because you know they're protecting and defending you know their expanding set of interests. So I I think you know if you talk about is it China's intention to take over the world, um, you know I I tend to be pretty skeptical of a statement like that. 
But I do think that it is um, likely that China's interests are going to expand and that it is going to protect them and that it's very hard for us to predict how far that's going to go because we really can't say for sure the trajectory of China's you know, um, power uh, increase and, and uh, evolution over time. Um, so I do like to focus on China's behavior, but you know, what I would say is that China, to me, and, you know, Yahweh probably has strong views on, on this and um, others as well, but, but to me, the, the refrain that I hear in talking to Chinese counterparts, the subtext of it is, you know, we just want to be respected. <laughs> and they feel that they have not been respected. They have not been acknowledged as legitimate, as a legitimate major power. They are treated as different. And, you know, and this relates to history and insecurities about the legitimacy of their system, et cetera. Um, and, you know, it's very hard for the US in our system to confer this legitimacy in this respect. So, um, you know, that's, to me, that's really a, a key question that really um, has been left open every time there's a new administration that comes into, into office in the United States, we have this debate over how are we going to call the US-China relationship? And we can never, you know, call it something that the Chinese want it to be called because we can't, you know, confer that level of sort of equality or um, whatever you want to call it. So I think you know, that is kind of a central issue in the relationship that remains to be resolved, but I'd be curious um, to hear what you think about that. Well, I, I think that however we decide that relationship is, how expansion is, then our response would be, would be determined by that. So if we think China is an existential threat, then we're going to build up military and make kind of assumptions about countering that. So, and that can be very dangerous if it's wrong. Well, I don't <sighs> see how China constitutes an existential threat to the United States. I just don't see that. I don't, Yeah, that's not well, my position, but, and I look with skepticism upon people who say that it's an existential threat to the United States and our way of life. And it's, you know, these kinds of things that keep being said. Yeah, um, but there are those are out there, right? <laughs> yeah, but I don't think there's much yeah. justification for it. That no, I, I, heard, I, so. I, I agree, but I think that that characterization then becomes part of the story, and so it can, it, it's something that's very it's really important to get right, or at least be patient, as you're suggesting, right? Yeah, I mean, there is this sort of um, you know effort at mobilization. Um, and I'm not sure how compelling it is for people um, outside the DC beltway, at least. Um, you know, I don't think most people think of China as, um, you know, being that much of a, I mean, that they're out to sort of alter the US, you know, system and way of life. I just, I find it um, a little bit, you know, I think people outside of DC find that far fetched. Now, yeah, I, I hope mean, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> maybe we'll I find out here so. in the question and answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Yahweh, we'll turn it over to you. All right, uh, thanks, uh, Susan and Penny, for this very engaging and informative uh, conversation. Uh, let's uh, just uh, move away from US China because I have my entire uh, class. You mentioned your students uh, at Yale. Uh, so the students are probably interested in, you know, foreign service, you know, what, how do you deal with Chinese uh, diplomats? Uh, how do you interact with them? And for those uh, students who aspire to be future diplomats, you know, what do you say to them that, like, you know, go for it? What, what is the most uh, exhilarating, exhilarating part of being a diplomat? Oh, you mean to be a U.S. diplomat? Yeah. Right, um, right. Well, I mean, I um, loved my foreign service career. I mean, I just think it's the best job you could possibly have in the world. And the reason, you know, I didn't get into it um, because of politics or, 
or activism or anything. I just liked, I mean, I just liked exploring foreign cultures, foreign languages. Um, I found that, you know, it was really important for me to live in a place in order to understand it. So, uh, you know, it was just became very natural to me to think of, oh, you know, going into the foreign service would be great. The other thing I loved was that you can be a generalist um, and, you know, I, as a person who always wanted to avoid studying for a PhD, I thought this is perfect. I get to basically start a new PhD every three years when I move to a new country, and then I never have to actually write that dissertation. So you can really go deep and study uh, a new place, a new culture, meet new people. Um, and, you know, it's very rewarding. Um, all over the world with a few exceptions and very, very few exceptions. I mean, people are very welcoming of Americans, even official Americans, even you know, if they have problems with the US government, you can do so much good by being you know, um, uh, a strong and energetic you know, kind of supporter and advocate uh, out there on the front lines talking about what the U.S. government is doing and talking about, you know, what the U.S. government is doing with the host country. Um, it's just it's just a fantastic uh, career. And I, I got I, I they taught me two years um, of in, intensive Chinese language. So there's a lot of benefits to be had if you're if you're interested in sort of languages and travel and um, of course you know you come back to Washington DC and you get to uh, be at the center of the policy making whirlwind there and uh, see up close how the sausage gets made with this which is also fascinating if a little frustrating at times but I, I think um, you know and the thing I will say is and Yahweh can back me up on this I mean the colleagues you have in the Foreign Service are just some of the best people you'll ever meet in the whole world. And I, I miss them all every day. Um, my State Department and other uh, Foreign Service, other agency colleagues at embassies or being back in Washington, it's just a great group of people to, to spend your life with. So um, I couldn't recommend it more. I don't know, you know, other, I mean, maybe we have foreign citizens watching that want to think about joining their diplomatic service. I w must say that the Chinese diplomats are some of the best I've ever met. Um, they are very good at their jobs. They work very hard and they do a good job representing their country. And, and you know, I, I still keep in touch with a lot of them on WeChat. Um, you know, they're they're, they're tremendous uh, resources and terrific counterparts in human beings. And so I just think it's, it's a great area to, to, to devote your life to. Thank you for, the, for that answer. Uh, we do have a lot of questions uh, in the q and I'm sort of uh, going to group them together. Uh, so the, the one question is on, on the uh, trade war. So will the Biden administration uh, unilaterally or in negotiation with China to bilaterally uh, eliminate the, the tariff. Where do you see uh, phase two uh, of the trade uh, negotiation? And third, uh, China and other country signed a reset. You know, well, will this uh, impact uh, US uh, calculation and, and decision in, in the area of trade? Yeah, these are Great questions. And these are the questions that everyone in Asia is asking me and uh, also questions that are really hard for me to answer uh, because, you know, President elect Biden on trade has a pretty tough road to hoe, I would say. Um, you know, the American population is pretty skeptical at this point of, of trade, of uh, kind of globalization, of dealing with the after effects of globalization, mitigating the effects of globalization is a, is a big, has been a big theme on the campaign trail and it's gonna continue to be a big theme here. So, you know, I think that obviously Joe Biden has been a proponent of free trade in the past, certainly. Um, he's now got to deal with domestic constituencies that are skeptical and a Congress that is probably gonna be skeptical. So um, I think he will look to 
work on trade with China. I think the phase one trade deal needs some surgery and probably both China and the US, the new Biden administration at least, will feel that that needs to be um, looked at and discussed. Uh, certainly uh, the Biden administration would be more interested in a phase two type of discussion with China than the phase one uh, managed trade type deal that was negotiated. So, and, and there was discussions with the Chinese ongoing under the Obama administration. They didn't get concluded, but they got close to being concluded. And the Trump administration has had taken some of those issues up um, uh, as part of a potential phase two. So I think that that could continue. I don't think this is gonna be the first thing out of the box though. Um, and I'm not sure that the tariffs that are currently on China are going to be adjusted immediately. Maybe there will be some small adjustment early on, but uh, not a big adjustment. I think that the tariffs that are most likely to come off first are gonna be the 232 tariffs on steel which hit basically everybody, including our allies. Um, so that's not mainly aimed at, at China. Um, and so we'll just have to see, you know, how quickly he engages with China on trade. I mean, I think, as I mentioned in my remarks, the, the, the first kinds of moves are going to be in trying to sort of consolidate more um, the relationships with the allies that have been undermined in the last few years and try to get things straightened out there first. But, um, you know, I think a discussion with China on trade will certainly have to come. I would advocate that it continues. You know, you have to say that the one thing under the Trump administration that, um, that did sort of uh, surprise is that Robert Lighthizer, who started off as the biggest anti-China hawk, became the biggest defender of this phase one trade agreement and good friend of Liu He by the end. And he, I'm sure, in the course of all those conversations, learned a lot about the Chinese system and the Chinese economy and the realities of the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what you get from a negotiation. Um, that you don't get in just a dialogue. If you're negotiating with someone, you're really, it's a mutual education session really. And you're learning a lot about the nuts and bolts of how things really work and what are the real constraints. And I think that should, should continue. But I, I can't uh, say that it's gonna produce early fruit. Um, I know the question about RCEP, you know, this was a um, negotiation long in the works um, and I think it's, you know, certainly important for the region that it got to be concluded. I know the countries in the region that were party to it are quite uh, happy about it. Um, it was supposed to be sort of that was going on at the same time as the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was the APEC based um, sort of uh, trade liberalization agreement that was being negotiated simultaneously with RCEP. Of course, the US dropped out of that under Trump on the first day of his administration. It was uh, you know, salvaged by the CPTPP 11. But um, you know, I, now we have these two trade agreements in Asia and the US isn't in either one of them. And I think that that is not an, not an ideal situation just to put it mildly. Just uh, as a segue, because you talk about RCEP, uh, India uh, at one time uh, was part of RCEP, uh, decided to drop out. So we have a question from Henry Yu asking about the trilateral China, US, India relationship, you know, in consideration of the recent uh, clash between India and China. Well, you know, when you were still at the State Department, uh, when Secretary uh, Tillerson gave a speech at uh, CSIS talking about you know, the, the, the bonding between uh, Washington and, and New Delhi uh, seemed, you know, aimed at pushing India uh, to be closer to the, to the U.S. and part of the containment uh, of, of China. Where, where do you see this uh, trilateral relationship going? Yeah, um, so I was definitely still in the State Department when we, uh, put forward the Trump administration's Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm -hmm. And the, my way of thinking about that strategy was that it was mostly um, a kind of a continuation 
of um, the process that had started under the Obama administration with the rebalance to the Asia Pacific. And the idea was, you know, the US joined the East Asia summit and we became more involved in the architecture in East Asia. Um, but part of that was also the idea was to get India more involved in East Asian issues uh, because they had tended to be uh, fairly, you know, self-isolated and not really engaged much in the East Asia uh, arena. And so, um, you know, the Indo-Pacific strategy was, you know, the Quad actually, this uh, uh, arrangement between the US, Japan, Australia, and India had started under the Obama administration, then run into trouble um, when the Indians didn't want the Australians to participate, et cetera. But um, I think that the courting of India and bringing India more into the East Asian kind of arena is going to be a very long process, but one that uh, most US governments in the future, and I think including the Biden administration will continue to work on, it's not gonna bear fruit quickly. Um, and you know, I think people who were following the RCEP negotiation process were probably not that surprised that India ended up dropping out. Um, because I mean, now with India out of RCEP, um, you know, India is really, that's kind of, they're not engaged now in that, um, in that framework. They're not in APEC. So they're really just in the EAS and then there's the quad and, um, you know, they have been, it's been hard to get them to sort of engage. And I think we'll keep working on that, but um, I don't think that India wants to sign up with the US for an anti-China um, kind of approach. And I don't think that the quad, you know, the Japan, US, Australia, India um, grouping should even be seen as an anti-China grouping. Um, really, it's more about trying to get India in <laughs> than mm. it is about trying to face off against China. I don't think um, that, that it's going to be successful as a sort of an anti-China grouping. Um, but I think that this, you know, trying to get, I mean, U.S.-India relations have really been, you know, long. I remember when under the Bush administration, Nick Burns was trying to get the one, two, three agreement for nuclear, civilian nuclear cooperation with India. Um, so we've been working on the US-India relationship for a long time and it's, it's coming along, it's improving, but it's very slow. And I think getting India into East Asia will also come along, but it will also be very slow. Um, and, but I think we'll keep going on it. This uh, next question has, uh, you know, a lot of audience actually uh, are concerned is the uh, Justice Department China initiative. Uh, it's uh, to, to many of us, it's racial profiling. And, and Christopher Ray, director of FBI, in his speech said that every 10 hours, you know, they open uh, investigation of ethnic uh, Chinese. Do you see that will continue to, to be at the Justice Department or uh, Biden administration may uh, review it and, and probably, uh, you know, fold it? I mean, this is a very good question. I think that this um, FBI looking at what, um, you know, foreign researchers and, I mean, and particularly Chinese researchers, um, what, what they might be doing and what kinds of economic espionage might be happening had, had really also picked up before the Trump administration. But I think unfortunately under the Trump administration, it became this kind of um, this flag or this propaganda push um, public, very public, uh, you know, named the China initiative that was new. And um, I think that that was unfortunate uh, I think the Biden administration will certainly, you know, they will keep up the efforts to look for uh, anyone who may be engaged in espionage or anyone who may be engaged in inappropriate conduct, but they will get away from labeling it, um, associating it with a particular country, i.e. China. And I think they will play down the public um, kind of campaign aspect of it, which I think has been 
you know, uh, well, Maggie Lewis has written at Seton Hall has written a lot on this, that it's, um, it's really um, kind of outside of the bounds of what we would normally think of as, as kind of the, our, our, our rule of law principles, let's put it that way. And certainly it has tagged the um, Asian American community, not just the Chinese American community, but, uh, but the whole Asian American community uh, with a brush of suspicion, which has led to some really horrifying outcomes. And I think that the Biden administration in general is going to be much more sort of principled on these kinds of issues and go back to basics. So I, I think I don't, I don't think it's going to fold or go away completely, but certainly the character of it will be changed and it will be um, put into proper context. Thanks. Uh, the next question is uh, from Ray Wang. If you remember, uh, he traveled with you and me through the provinces and he now is the librarian uh, of the University of New Orleans. And uh, he asked me to convey his uh, best regards to you and hopefully you'll be able to, to travel to, to New Orleans. His question is, uh, you know, talking about U.S.-China cooperation, can you give a specific example where, you know, both leaders and, and people think, you know, this is where we can actually cooperate and, and how, for example, you know, if you say North Korea, you know, what will U.S. want China do in resolving this or pandemic? You know, can U.S. and China really cooperate on fighting the virus? you know, here at the domestic U.S. battle or that cooperation has to happen just like Ebola. It has to happen outside the U.S., given the, the how toxic the atmosphere here is in terms of, you know, the negative view of, of China. Yeah, I think this is a great question because when we say U.S.-China cooperation, oftentimes what we really mean is kind of parallel efforts toward the same goal. We're an area where we have overlapping interests, where we're both going for the same goal, and we want to both work in a parallel direction in order to achieve that goal. And we call that cooperation when, you know, in fact, it may or may not involve actual material cooperation, but it's more like coordination. So we saw this, for example, in I think the Ebola outbreak, um, where, you know, the US contributed certain things to the efforts to mitigate that outbreak in Africa, China contributed certain things, we coordinated on what we were each doing. In some cases, US troops helped offload Chinese planes and things like that. So that was real material cooperation. But in general, it was mostly parallel and coordinated. So on uh, an issue like the pandemic, I certainly wouldn't anticipate having, you know, Chinese doctors fly in in a plane and start dispensing vaccines here. But what I do think would be very important, um, and, you know, it's true that even back in the 60s, I think it was uh, the US and the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War uh, undertook a joint effort to eradicate smallpox in um, sort of the, the developing world and sent, you know, doctors also, I think, in parallel, but, you know, mobilized resources for vaccines and sent, um, you know, groups out to try to, to try to, um, develop, uh, not develop the vaccines, but distribute the vaccines. And I think that kind of an effort with respect to the pandemic in the developing world could happen. Of course, we've got to deal with the pandemic at home first uh, before we could, um, uh, presumably before we could contribute to that kind of an effort. But I think on vaccine development and on vaccine distribution even more so, I would think that the US and China would both have a ton of resources that they would be able to contribute to making sure a vaccine can be rolled out around the world you know, in, a, in an efficient way. Um, on climate change is the other place where people keep talking about cooperation. Um, and really uh, there are several different avenues on climate change. One is kind of a mutual pressuring, which we call cooperation and really isn't cooperation, but it, um, it again is this area where we have a mutual interest and we're trying to do parallel efforts to reach that goal and we pressure each other really to undertake those efforts. But then there's also areas for cooperation and technology development on climate change, I think where we've 
work together and teams of researchers to do uh, research on things like carbon capture, sequestration, other things that would help in uh, help all of us in uh, being able to mitigate uh, climate change. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is is a, is a big one. Uh, many uh, in the audience have raised this: is, is you know, China's uh, red line, uh, Taiwan. You know, uh, potential uh, skirmishes uh, between U.S. and China in the South China Sea can be contained. But the issue on Taiwan, and you probably noticed, uh, Secretary Pompeo recently mentioned Taiwan has never been part of China. And, and you know, this is forcing China into, uh, you know, I would call it a, a war making mode, uh, you know, if this is gonna escalate, you know, how this is gonna be contained and what American interest is being served for, uh, you know, US, this is from, from the audience, for US, you know, to keep this, you know, we, we are going to defend Taiwan regardless uh, of, of, you know, causes or, uh, you know, what is going to happen uh, in, in, the, in the coming years. So how, how this is, is going to be managed so that US and China uh, do not get into a, a war? Uh, it needs to be managed better, <laughs> is what I would say, uh, from both sides. And, um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, our, our, our one China uh, policy, China talks about the one China principle. We talk about the catechism of commitments that the US has made um, with respect to the normalization in uh, 1979, which you, uh, Yahweh Liu, have great familiarity with and which President Carter was actually involved in. Um, most of the issues surrounding the normalization had to do with Taiwan, actually. So, you know, this, it's clear to any government official in the United States that this is, you know, the key issue for China. And I think uh, people in the Trump administration do know that. President Trump himself even does understand that, I believe. Um, and certainly people in the Biden administration who have been around the horn uh, for years in foreign policy circles in the US do understand this. I mean, the, the real question is, you know, how far can all of those original understandings take us in dealing with a question, the nature of which has so fundamentally changed from 1979 till now. And I think, you know, we really need to sit down and have some very serious conversations about, you know, how we can make sure that this issue develops in a way that doesn't immutably damage the interests of China and immut or immutably damage the interests of the US or both of us. And certainly the US wants to avoid conflict. I think China wants to avoid conflict um, over this issue, but, but, but how is this issue going to be managed going forward in a way that, uh, you know, is not going to upset um, the work of the last 40 years of all of us, I think needs to be discussed. I mean, US, um, the US takes very seriously its role and certainly the US Congress in particular takes very seriously its, its feeling that it is kind of the anointed uh, protector of um, the people on Taiwan and, you know, all of all that they have accomplished um, in their vibrant democracy and their very strong society, etc. And of course, um, you know, that is not uh, appreciated by uh, people in China or, or government government officials in China who who see that, um, you know, they have a, a, com a completely different idea with respect to how things should go uh, in the future with respect to Taiwan. So I think this is a very hard issue. It's extremely complicated. I, I think in the Biden administration, you will be dealing with people on this question um, who, will, who will operate in good faith in trying to preserve stability and preserve the status quo. So I think we will be moving to a better place on Taiwan if we can get through the next couple of months. I don't to be honest, think that the current 
team has always been operating in um, good faith on, on this issue, uh, especially recently. But I, I hope that we can uh, show enough restraint to get through to a period when, and I think the sort of behavior of the Biden administration so far, the president-elect and his team on this issue, even, even so far since the election, has demonstrated that they have a certain amount of understanding of the gravity of this issue. Um, but, you know, the U.S. certainly feels a, a great responsibility to people on Taiwan, and that's not going to change either. All right, we're, we're getting to the end uh, of, of today's uh, presentation, uh, the town hall, so to speak. So one uh, quick question and one bigger one for you to, to wrap up. The quick question is, uh, uh, one uh, audience asked about the Confucius Institute, but it leads to the question is, do you think China has this coordinated uh, united front approach to try to penetrate American campuses, you know, state level government, you know, uh, state legislator uh, and uh, Confucius Institute is a spy agency. Uh, is, is that paranoia or is, is that uh, a real uh, threat posed uh, by, by China? Hmm. Uh, well, I personally um, would say that I don't believe that that, that is the case. Um, do some people believe that that is the case? Perhaps. Are some people using that to make a political point? Uh, probably. But I think the problem really is that China and the Chinese government has shown increasing um, levels of, um, you know, sensitivity to criticism, increasing interest in finding out who outside the borders of China is criticizing uh, the government and is um, going to greater lengths than ever before to try to gather that information and to pressure people as a result of that information. And I think that that is of great concern to people. So, um, you know, I think as long as, and I, I have a lot of trouble with the fuzziness of US analysis of this problem, frankly. Um, and I think, you know, Confucius Institutes are mostly just um, uh, helpful purveyors of Chinese language and culture um, um, availability. And I think that in a couple of cases, there may have been some things that people did that wasn't exactly in keeping with their charter. And you can look into those matters and you can um, you know, correct them or, or whatever. The, the main issue is transparency. If people have a feeling that someone has an agenda that's not explicitly stated and is working that agenda unbeknownst to the people uh, that are concerned, then um, people feel that that is, you know, a transgression of some kind. And I do think that, uh, you know, the United Front and um, all of these organizations do not always operate completely transparently. That's probably because they're not used to operating transparently. And it's not because they're trying to um, necessarily hide anything, but it's just a kind of a way of doing things. And uh, it has gotten them into some trouble, I would say. Now, certainly there are probably cases where people are bribing legislators. I mean, there are things that people do that are wrong and those should be looked into and people should be held accountable and they should be exposed. But I think, um, you know, the transparency of what different organizations are doing, where they're getting funding, um, you know, what kinds of things they are, um, you know, keeping tabs on, et cetera, would be helpful to dispel the notion that this is such a widespread phenomenon and that it's all about, you know, underhanded, malign influence, et cetera, which I, I don't subscribe to that, but I think we need to undertake some rigorous reform of practices in order to dispel that impression. All right, that uh, brings us to, to the final uh, question 
Uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you mentioned that uh, President-elect Biden has a very realistic view of, of China. That reminds me of what he said uh, in Iowa uh, and earlier. Uh, he said, uh, you know, come on, China is not going to steal our lunch. And then he started talking about corruption in China, you know, the mountains in the West and uh, oceans uh, on the East. You know, I, I think what he's trying to say is, there is no existential threat posed by China to the American way of life. So quick answers, yes or no answer is, do you uh, believe you know, that that actually should be the, the perception of American leaders? The longer uh, answer required from you is, uh, you, know, you think the American leaders will one day sit down with the Chinese leader and say, you know, we don't like your system. However, we do believe that system, particularly uh, starting in 1979, all the way to now, uh, 42 years, you know, that system has delivered for the Chinese people. Uh, that system has also uh, made China a better country, uh, made uh, US a richer country, and made this world uh, a better place that we are going to reconcile with that system hopefully with the difference in the system, uh, we could still work together, make both of our countries better and this place a, a more beautiful, uh, more uh, comfortable place. Okay, let me, um, let me take the second one first. Um, I think that actually under the Obama administration, Obama Biden administration, that that actually happened already. So I don't think that that would be a stretch to think that that could happen again. It would be harder to have it happen now uh, because of what's happened now in the last four years and um, because of the deterioration in the relationship, obviously, and the public rhetoric around all of it. But um, I think that essentially what you said, I mean, not word for word, of course, but the idea of it um, was uh, conveyed under Obama um, you know, in settings with the top leadership of China. So, um, so that could happen again, I hope, I, I assume. Um, the first uh, question, um, what was it again? <laughs> it, it's the realistic view of, of China. Is China oh. is so bogged yes. by domestic uh, tension issues that China never uh, will, uh, and certainly is not posing an existential threat to the US supremacy and, and to the global order by the same token. Yeah. So to me, when, 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 um, when Joe Biden says things like, you know, China's not gonna eat our lunch, what he's saying is that I am confident in the system that the American uh, way of life has uh, developed and I am confident that we can continue to thrive uh, even in the face of competition with China. That's how, and he thinks we can prevail. I mean, he thinks the system in the US is resilient and dynamic and he has confidence in it as opposed maybe to the way that President Trump, you know, portrayed um, the competition, which was much more sort of dire and dramatic and, um, you know, uh, as you say, a threat to our way of life, et cetera. So I think that's really the difference. It's really coming from more of a place of what are they, what are they, what are they seeking to and, and aiming to emphasize about America as opposed to what it is they're seeing as inadequate or something in, the, in what China's doing. But certainly Joe Biden spent a lot of time in China and he knows um, the challenges that China faces. And I'm sure that he probably has, which I don't know if Trump has any uh, real feeling for the China's internal situation and the and the challenges um, that uh, Chinese leaders would face realistically. So I think Biden is talking about both of those things, um, whereas Trump is choosing to sort of emphasize the you know they're coming to get us and it's more of a mobilization tactic is is the way I read it. But um, if that answers your question, it does. Uh, on behalf of. Uh... The China Research Center, you know, Penny, uh, the founding director, and Han Chao, the, the current director. On behalf uh, of uh, my students, uh, people in the greater Atlanta community, and people in China and in other parts of the US, 
uh, we thank you, Susan, uh, for your great analysis of the current uh, relationship and where this relationship is going to go. I think the audience right now, we still have 122, agree uh, with me that uh, you know it, uh, there, there, there will be a new page and, and we should be a little bit more uh, optimistic and uh, with a strong conviction that uh, uh, this relationship has to be managed well. Uh, otherwise, uh, all of us uh, are going to suffer uh, from mismanagement. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, thank you, will, Susan. Yeah, we'll thank you. Uh, thank we you, will. Susan. Yeah, thank we, you, uh, Hantel. Good to see hi. you. Hey, good to see you <laughs> virtually. <laughs> virtually. Good to be with all of you. Okay. All right. yeah. I'll also send all the Q&A questions to everyone, because uh, I, I think there are great questions. and. Uh, it will be good for us to look at the questions and continue to think about the relationship. Thank you, yeah, Sarah. I agree. All right, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank right. you so Bye. much. Good night. Bye, Susan. Bye. 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 Uh, so, Penny, just the two of us, uh, what I'll do is, uh, you know, because we have emails uh, in, in the Zoom, uh, just like what I did with the town hall. I yeah. uh, will send, send the link. And then uh, I guess we can put this up at, at the, so I was a little late in start starting the recording. I should do the automatic recording. So basically it, it missed my introduction part. Oh, which, too bad. <laughs> which, which, is, which is fine. Cause uh, I, I think uh, as soon as Susan started I started the recording. Uh, okay. Yeah. We're learning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and really, thank you for taking the lead on this Zoom stuff. It's I can learn from you. <laughs> yeah, sure, and anytime, anytime. All right, thanks. And uh, I, I saw you in the morning, and uh, I saw yeah. you now, and uh, I'll, I'll see you hopefully on Friday too. Uh, okay, great. All right. All right. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.